Now that's all the didactic theoretical part. Let's try and make it a little more clinical. So I will share a case with you. Um, this was a 25 year old lady who's been recently married for the last three months. No comorbidities, no diabetes, hypothyroidism, no blood pressure, no kidney disease at all. Young, healthy lady. She presented with dysuria, fever, suprapubic tenderness, and urgency. Classic cystitis. If you go through the presentation of the different urinary tract infection, this is classic for cystitis. The CUE showed significant WBCs. We, we remember more than five is significant. Leukocyte esterase, which is produced by the WBCs, was positive. Nitrite, which is a very, very specific test for urinary tract infection, is positive. And the rest were normal. Urine culture was done, and it showed a significant growth of E. coli, which is the commonest bacteria. And this is classical, what we call honeymoon cystitis. And what do we do here in this situation? It's very clear. The, it's classic urinary tract infection, classic cystitis. She needs to be treated with antibiotics. The dose and the duration, I will come to later on during this talk. But this patient has got classic urinary tract infection, cystitis, and she needs to be treated with antibiotics. Why do people get urinary tract infections? What is the pathogenesis? And what does the body do to prevent these infections? The next few slides are going to, we're going to discuss these. Uh, now, normally the normal flora of uh, the urethra in males and the uh, vagina in ladies have dysteroids, streptococcal species, staphylococcal species, and lactobacilli. Excuse me. Right. So these protect the urinary tract from gram negative bacilli because they are colonizing, they don't allow the other bacteria to take over their space. But when you give antibiotics, or there are some other infections, or you use contraceptives, either uh, things which are applied there, or spermicidal jellies, or barrier methods, or whatever. In this situation, the normal flora are altered, and the gram-negative bacteria can colonize and start with the tract infection. Also, during sexual intercourse itself, bacteria which are, can be pushed in from either the distal, the urethra from the male, or from the introitus, the vaginal introitus of the female, and they can enter the urinary tract and can start, and the infections can start. How does the body protect you from urinary tract infection? The first thing is mechanical. When you pass urine, bacteria are uh, removed while voiding. It's the flushing mechanism. That's why nephrologists tell you to drink plenty of water. Not only does it help you keep the other things, your, your electrolytes and fluid balance in place, it also helps reduces, reduce the chance of infection by just the process of voiding. The high urea levels in the urine, I'm not talking about high urea in the blood, high urea levels in the urine also kill the bacteria or inhibit bacterial growth. And the acidic urine, so when the pH is less than 5.5, the chance of bacteria growing is much less. High urine osmolality also inhibits bacteria. Prostatic secretions have antibacterial properties and they prevent urinary tract infections. The bladder wall itself has got neutrophils and these can clear the bacteria by, by themselves. And we all know that secretory IgA, which is produced by all mucosal surfaces, whether it's the GI tract, the genitourinary tract, or other mucosa, they also are protective and they can fight off infection. The length of the urethra itself reduces the chances of infection. The longer the urethra, the less the chance of infection. That's why males have got less chance of uh, getting urinary tract infection as compared to females. And vesicourethral valves, which are competent, which help unidirectional flow of urine from the kidneys towards the bladder, they also help prevent infection. If the vesicourethral valves are not patent, then there will be reflux of urine into the kidneys, and that can not only cause infection because of the state stasis, it can also cause ascending infections and pyelonephritis, which is very dangerous because acute pyelonephritis can later lead on to chronic pyelonephritis. Like I said, females have got a higher propensity to getting urinary tract infections because their urethra is shorter, they're closer to the anus, and it ends right near the labia. The common age group, females in the reproductive age group from 20 to 50 are more likely, whereas males more than 50 are more likely to get urinary tract infections because of prostate problems and retention of urine and stasis. 
So during sexual activity, the, the, the activity itself pushes bacteria inside. If the male is not being circumcised, there's more chance of urinary tract infections and voiding after you intercourse will clear the bacteria. Homosexual men and those with HIV infections also have got a high chance of getting urinary tract infections. Pregnancy is another physiological situation where the chances of infection are high. That's because of the hormonal uh, valuations that the urethral tone is reduced. There is decreased urethral peristalsis. So the, there's more urinary stasis and there is temporary incompetence of the vesicourethral valves. And even during delivery, many a time, catheterization is required and that introduces infection. Sometimes obstruction can also lead to hydronephrosis. That also leads to stasis of urine and that causes urinary tract infections. And obstruction can be either a tumor, it could be a stone, it could be a stricture, it could be prostate enlargement itself. So there are so many, so many, so many predisposing factors to infection. And that's why we need to do further evaluation when somebody comes in with a urinary tract infection to prevent these from happening again and again. And this is a picture of a healthy kidney up there and an obstruction there. You can see the stone there. Because of that, there is hydronephrosis. Urine is jammed here and infection can start. This is another one where the prostate is enlarged. The urethra is blocked there. So both the ureters are swollen. There is hydronephrosis in both kidneys. And this can cause uh, urinary tract infection in this patient. Let's look at the next case. This is a 30-year-old male who has absolutely no comorbidities, just like the, the lady, uh, the honeymoon lady who had no comorbidities. He did a routine health check. He didn't have any symptoms. He just got a routine health check. And uh, to his surprise, he found that he had a lot of WBCs in the urine. The leukocyte esterase was positive. Nitrite was negative. But the rest were normal. So this was definitely a lot of WBCs in the urine. And the urine culture grew staph epidermidis. Now, staph epidermidis is a bacteria, a gram-positive bacteria, which is present in the skin. So there's a very high likelihood that this possible bacteria, if you see this bacteria, it's likely to be a contaminant. So this patient, 30-year-old, he's a male, less chance of getting an infection, no comorbidities, not a diabetic, just a routine health check, no symptoms, and significant growth of staph epidermidis. Should you treat or not? This you should not treat because one, the bacteria is not the common bacteria that you see. Two, he has no symptoms. Three, he has no comorbidities. Four, he's a young man and it's very unlikely that he'll have a urinary tract infection. So this patient you would not treat. Let's look at the third case here. This is a 15-year-old male who had a kidney transplant a year back. Other than that, no other comorbidities. He's been asymptomatic. He's been on routine follow-up on that. We saw about a small amount of WBCs, 5 to 10, neither here nor there. Leukocyte esterase was negative, nitrite was negative, everything was normal. But we did a urine culture and that showed staph epidermis. The same organism which was there in the earlier patient, younger man with no comorbidities. Here you have a, a young boy who's post-transplant with staph aureus and again no symptoms. What to do here? This patient you would treat. It's very clear that somebody who has got asymptomatic bacteriuria, you generally do not treat. But there are three or four situations where you would treat. One, a pediatric. Because young children, if they have, even if they have asymptomatic bacteriuria and it's untreated, it can lead on to pyelonephritis, chronic pyelonephritis and kidney dysfunction. So this boy is 15 years, so he's, he's young. So he's in the pediatric age group. So you would treat. Those who are pregnant and have asymptomatic bacteria need to be treated because in pregnancy, the urinary stasis is much higher. They're, in, they're more likely that they're going to get infections. And it's if they get an infection, it's dangerous for the mother as well as the fetus because there's low birth weight and other fetal complications that can happen. Maternal complications like sepsis can happen. So pregnancy. Those who had a transplant, even if it's asymptomatic bacteriuria, should be treated because if they're not treated, they can develop infection of the transplant kidney and they can have graft dysfunction. So these three situations of asymptomatic bacteriuria should be treated. So pediatric age group, pregnancy, and transplant. Any other group, if they're asymptomatic, for example, a diabetic or an elderly male who have no symptoms, just we found that they have some kind of... Uh, 
pus or some uh, bacterial growth in the urine without any symptoms, they don't need to be treated. So this particular patient will have to be treated. The previous patient is not to be treated and probably the previous patient did not collect the urine culture in an appropriate way. He didn't do a proper midstream clean catch. That's why we got a contamination of staph epidermitis. So that patient would not need treatment. There are other predisposing factors. I don't think I want to go too much in detail, but I just want you to want to draw your attention to this particular thing, the bacterial virulence factors. And uh, E. coli has all this. The strains of E. coli are uh, predisposing you to getting infection. They have fibrillae, which help them to climb up the urinary tract and go from a descending to an ascending urinary tract infection. And we also have on the ureal epithelial cells, you have bacterial receptors, which help or invite the bacteria inside them. So these are some more host factors, which, and those are genetic. There's nothing you can do about it. They're non-modifiable, but they're there. Reflux, again, predisposes to urinary tract infections. I don't want to go too much in detail there. This is something which we all need to know because in a hospital setup, a nosocomial infection is possible, it's common, and it's extremely dangerous. And this catheter-associated UTI or nosocomial infections, as opposed to community-acquired infections, they can develop in 10 to 15 percent of hospitalized patients. And this is a takeaway message for everybody. The risk of infection in a catheterized patient is 3 to 10 percent per day. If you want to average it out, the risk of infection per day in a catheterized patient is 5 percent. So at the end of two days, 10 percent of them are going to be infected. At the end of 20 days, there is a 100 percent chance of a patient on a catheter being infected, which is the logic behind saying that we should change a urinary catheter every two weeks. Because after two weeks, the chance of infection is 70%. So if you go by this 5% risk of infection per day, within two weeks, you have to, so somebody's got an indwelling catheter, you have to change it within two weeks. Hospital acquired infections usually are asymptomatic, but they're usually resistant strains and they're very, 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 very difficult to treat. And the bacteria can reach the bladder either through the catheter, the intraluminal way, or they can go along the pericatheter route because of biofilm formation, which helps the bacteria to ascend into the, into the urinary tract. The treatment is obviously a removal of the catheter, catheter remove the source, source control, and give a short course of culture uh, specific antibiotics.